Okay, so I'm going to tell you about a two-year study that we did in four provinces examining the role of healthcare providers in workers' compensation system and return to work after injury. So the study sought to address three broad questions. What is the role of healthcare providers in the workers' compensation system and in return to work? What challenges do healthcare providers face? And what can help engage healthcare providers in the workers' compensation system and return to work? So the study consisted of three parts. The first was a document analysis of materials developed for healthcare providers about their role in return to work and in the compensation process. So I actually did a plenary on this a few months ago. Um, so I am going to touch on this part very briefly in this presentation in case people weren't here for, for my previous plenary. And then um, the study also consisted of interviews with healthcare providers examining their experiences with workers' compensation and return to work, and interviews with case managers about how they interact with healthcare providers and how they view um, the healthcare provider role in return to work. So I'm going to talk um, to you very briefly now about this first, uh, the first uh, part of the study, which is this resource scan. So we, we did um, a document analysis um, identifying resources created for physicians specifically about their role in return to work and in the compensation system more broadly. And we looked at pamphlets, websites, workshops, guidelines, and we focused specifically on physicians um, because they're the primary treating clinician during workers' compensation claims. And we wanted to know, what are physicians being told about return to work? What are some of the key messages about their role? And are there any gaps and contradictions in terms of what they're being told? <coughs> We searched for resources in each Canadian province and territory, and um, we looked at specific sources such as the WCBs, provincial and federal, federal government ministries, um, uh, medical regulatory bodies, post-secondary institutions providing medical training, union and worker organizations, and community and NGOs. So this is where we found these resources. So before I tell you um, just briefly about the resources, a few caveats. Um, so we were specifically interested in directed and not general resources. And what I mean by this is when we were looking for information, we would go on, let's say, a workers' compensation board a website and specifically to the healthcare providers section and not look at all information provided on the website. So again, we were specifically looking at resources directed uh, at healthcare providers. And this was really a gray literature uh, search and analysis. And what that meant was that it was a constantly shifting landscape. So we found that materials were added, modified, moved, and sometimes they were removed altogether. And I say this because sometimes people know of materials, and those materials right now might be different than they were when we first uh, looked at them at the start of the study. We also know that we probably missed some materials, so we found references to workshops and programs, but then weren't able to locate further information about, um, about those. And certain uh, content was behind um, like a password lock, and so we weren't able to access certain types of content as well. None of the resources that I'm uh, briefly going to talk about were included, uh, included were um, after were developed after October 2014, which is a while ago now. Uh, but the reason for such a delay was, like I said, this was done at the very start of, of our uh, project, which was a, a two-year study. So we identified 180 resources that met our uh, search criteria. And I'll just give you a brief snapshot of, uh, of those resources now. So we found that generally the materials encouraged physicians um, to support return to work. But the details regarding um, how this should be done were often lacking. So as an example, some of the materials said you should contact your employer, but then didn't give details about, okay, well, so who should you contact? Is it uh, an HR person? Is it an occupational health and safety representatives? How often should the contact be made? Uh, and what information as a healthcare provider should you be given, giving to 
uh, to the employer or the employer's contact. We also found use of uh, quite vague language, so terms such as early return to work or prompt reporting. And of course, these types of terms are very much open to interpretation and might mean different things to different people. The focus was also on returning to work, but not necessarily on staying at work. So there was little focus on problems um, the physician might encounter while treating injured workers and dealing with the compensation system or during the return to work process. So this is um, a, a resource from Saskatchewan that said, physicians should always assume that employers can and will accommodate even if workers think otherwise. So this notion that you know, things are gonna go fine with return to work. There is also limited guidance on invisible or complex conditions, things like chronic pain or episodic uh, disability. And mental health issues were typically only discussed, discussed as red flags. So if, you know, if your patient has a mental health condition, that's going to make return to work more difficult. Instead of um, a kind of more nuanced and, and get a discussion about what to do if your patient has a mental health condition, how can you help that patient return to work? And then finally, the resources tended not to provide physicians with the big picture of how compensation systems operate. So some of that information is available out there, but like I said, not much of that information is specifically geared towards healthcare providers and increasing their understanding of how the system operates and where they um, fit into the system. Okay. So keep that in mind, and I'm going to now uh, go on to talk about some of our interview uh, findings. Okay, so we, we conducted 131 uh, interviews with healthcare providers and case managers, and uh, we interviewed healthcare providers in Ontario, British Columbia, Manitoba, and Newfoundland and Labrador. And when we were doing our recruitment, we really wanted to speak to healthcare providers who had both a high and low volume of workers' compensation patients because we wanted people who had different levels of experience dealing with, um, with return to work and, and workers' compensation. But all of them had to have at least one workers' compensation patient in the last year, and all of them had actually had more than one. Um, Almost half of the healthcare providers were quite experienced, having more than 15 years of uh, experience in their practice. But again, we also wanted to speak to healthcare providers who were who were newer to their practice, and about 20% were in practice less than five years. And we also interviewed some uh, residents as well. well. One of the things we found that was quite interesting was that many of the participants we we interviewed had more than one role or had worked in different settings and. That was actually a, um, quite useful to our study because they were able to speak to um, their interactions with the board and uh, about how they were involved in return to work, taking in, into consideration their experience in these different types of settings. So as an example, you know, a participant might have worked in a walk-in clinic at the start of their career and then transitioned into having a private practice and then spoke about their experiences in both of those settings. Um, of the 34 case managers we interviewed, none of them w were workers' compensation case managers from Newfoundland or Ontario. We did interview some case managers from Ontario who self-identified as case managers, but they were a, a little bit different in that they were doing um, case management of workers' compensation cases, but they were working in a, with a large employer. So they were actually based at the employer, not, uh, not at the board, although some of them were former workers' compensation um, uh, came, uh, case managers. So this is just a bit of a snapshot of our, of our sample. So as you can see, we interviewed um, uh, the largest number were, were general practitioners and then also some specialists. Yep, specialists. And then um, at, at, towards the end of the study, we ended up interviewing some allied healthcare providers as well. And then with the case managers, we, we wanted to interview case managers who had different types of experiences at the board, so both with short and long-term claims uh, in the mental health area, particularly in, in BC, where they accept uh, gradual onset mental health uh, claims, and with vocational uh, rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. We recruited the healthcare providers uh, in a number of ways, so through professional networks, uh, medical associations, message boards specifically for, for healthcare providers, 
through social media. One of the things I didn't list there is also a bit through snowballing. And in BC and Manitoba, uh, through the Workers' <coughs> Compensation Board. So we specifically wanted to also speak to um, healthcare providers that worked within the board. And so uh, those two Workers' Compensation Boards helped us uh, do that. Uh, interviews were conducted in person or the telephone, depending on what the preference was of the healthcare provider, and also depending on where they lived, if they were in a remote area that was done by telephone. And we used Envivo to uh, organize the data. The transcripts were reviewed by, res by researchers and a code list was developed and then the data was uh, double coded and uh, then um, organized thematically. And we took an inductive approach and what I mean by that is that we didn't come into the study sort of uh, into the, looking at the data and uh, you know wanting to find particular themes, but rather the themes really came from the data that we that we collected. But of course, with the aim of addressing the research questions that I outlined at, at the start of the, the presentation. And we paid attention to contradictions, uh, any provincial differences, and also differences between healthcare provider uh, and case manager views as well. Okay. So I'll tell you now about our findings. I always feel very funny saying this first part because it's so obvious, but um, what we found was that when injuries are straightforward, things seem to go well. Um, and it, what I mean by that is when patients have a visible, acute, physical injury that is clearly work-related and supported by definitive, objective evidence, things usually go well. The, the forms that healthcare providers use, their contact with the board, the re remuneration, their system knowledge all seem to be adequate. And in most of those cases, the return to work process is also straightforward. So this healthcare provider said, so I mean, mostly it's just a simple injury, like someone burnt themselves at work or someone you know hurts themselves and they get better and they go back and those things go smoothly. We, the challenges arose um, when healthcare providers treated patients who had multiple injuries, gradual onset or complex conditions, things like concussions or um, certain MSK injuries, chronic pain, and mental health conditions. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the challenges that were raised um, by healthcare providers in the study, specifically around when they dealt with these types of uh, conditions. So the first, the first thing I want to talk about is a kind of misalignment of perspectives on the timing and appropriateness of return to work. So case managers tended to view return to work as a good thing in virtually all circumstances. And there really was a push for early return to work and work was viewed as an extension of the rehabilitation process. So this uh, case manager in Manitoba said, I always want to know what is the next step? So we are at four hours, can we go to six after two weeks? Are we at eight after two weeks? Can I go five pounds to 15 to 30 pounds? So there's that natural progression of improvement and they're also maximizing their return to work. I look, look at a return to work as not as much an employment program, but an extension of your rehab program. So basically you're going to work to exercise. So healthcare providers, um, of course, supported return to work. And we, we didn't interview anyone who said, you know, return to work, bad idea. They, they all were supportive of getting people back to work after an injury. But many felt that early return to work was not always appropriate, and in some cases might actually delay recovery. So this is a specialist from Manitoba who said, there's a real mismatch between the clinical picture from the standpoint of the treating physician to what the board deems acceptable. And I feel that they remove themselves from the realities of many workers that do not recover well from their injury. Many workers who don't receive timely treatment or their treatment outcomes are confounded by a return to work program that runs in counter purposes. So many cases where the return to work is premature and doesn't allow for adequate recovery. And that's usually around the lack of acceptance of ongoing musculoskeletal pain and limitations that the board feels is no longer their responsibility. So it was felt that premature return to work, it, in some instances, may delay recovery, particularly for injured workers who had chronic pain and mental health uh, issues. 
But sometimes the Workers' Compensation Board made a decision and the health care provider felt like his or her hands were tied. And this led to a great deal of frustration. So this is a specialist in Ontario who said, I think she's going to fail. I think she's going to have a setback, but I feel that my hands are tied because the WSIB specialist said that this should be done. In the end, this person who recommended this has no plans on ever seeing this person again or reassessing them. Each time you put someone back and it's unsuccessful, then that actually complicates things and makes it even less likely that they'll return to work successfully down the road. So we, we did find that there were sometimes these different perspectives on return to work, and this led to um, a suspicion that each party was pursuing their own agenda. And from, so from the perspective of case managers, the agenda of the healthcare provider was one of advocacy, that basically they would do you know, whatever the patient wanted, they were, just, they were just there to advocate for the, the patient. And from the healthcare provider's perspective, um, there was a suspicion that case managers were just concerned with cost containment, right? that they, they didn't really care about workers, they just wanted to contain the spending. So you could imagine that this kind of, um, I guess, dynamic led to a lack of collaborative action to solve these very complex uh, problems <coughs> and, and, and led to an increase in adversarial relations. So the next thing I want to talk about is, um, is this notion that, uh, that, that healthcare providers do not have a clear understanding of the workers' compensation system. And we were told that um, that many healthcare providers didn't really know much about the workers' comp system, how it functions, or what specifically their role was within, within the system. And again, this became particularly problematic when the claims uh, were complicated. So they had questions such as, how does the system work? Who makes decisions in the system? Who makes decisions about when a person's ready to go back to work, or you know, what sort of work they should go back to? How should functional limitations be determined? And what about work relatedness? What is done with the information provided? So as a healthcare provider, I give information to the board. What is done with that information? How is it used? What is the role of the healthcare provider beyond just treating uh, the injury or condition? What does the patient do at work? What will the return to work plan look like? And what is the healthcare provider's role in monitoring uh, that plan? And most importantly, what to do when things go wrong? So, the, the return to a work plan is not, is not working. The person is, have, is struggling remaining at work. What, what, what do I do as a healthcare provider? Of course, there were some exceptions. We, we interviewed um, occupational therapists, uh, occupational health physicians and nurses, chronic pain specialists, who actually had a great deal of knowledge about workers' compensation and about, about the return to work process. But for general practitioners, um, there was a view that was actually shared both by the healthcare providers and the case managers that there was a lack of understanding about the workers' compensation system and how, how it operated. So what, what are the consequences of this? Well, there was confusion about policies, procedures, decision-making processes, and, then, and this led to frustration on the part of uh, healthcare providers and case managers. Sometimes healthcare providers were unsure about how to best help their workers' comp patients. Um, what sort of information should they be providing to the board? Would this be good or bad for the patient? What sort of information should they be providing to the employer? Um, case managers reported that often mistakes and omissions were made on forms and, and reports. And we really got, got the sense that at least some healthcare providers really didn't realize the potential impact of some of these mistakes and omissions. And so, um, you know, might not realize that, that these omissions might actually lead to a claim being denied or certainly to being delayed. And of course, not understanding the system, again, made collaboration and joint decision making more, more difficult. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about was is sort of an um, umbrella um, theme that we, we termed system rigidity. And we were told in the study about rules and procedures that sometimes are applied too rigidly and don't accommodate circumstances of workers with complex injuries and conditions. 
So one example of that was uh, that the healthcare providers discussed was around recovery guidelines for certain conditions and injuries. So this is when um, you know there's a there's a guideline around how long it should take for you know X injury to heal, and and so we we look at that and sort of see how the patient is doing relative to that guideline. So this is a um, a participant in Ontario who said if someone fractures their elbow, yes, we understand the healing time is six to eight weeks. The cast is removed and they should be progressing. That's a benchmark. That doesn't necessarily mean everybody is going to heal the same way, but they'd rather make determinations on entitlement using those independent guidelines versus the doctor's specific medical opinion. So we heard that the adherence to these recovery guidelines was particularly problematic with mental health and chronic pain claims because what would happen then is if the, if the person went beyond the guidelines um, there would be interruptions to treatment because then the, um, you know, you'd have to see why the person wasn't recovering as expected. And these interruptions in treatment, for example, in mental health counseling or, or um, other types of treatment led to a great deal of patient distress and inevitably <coughs> delayed recovery. The other, the other issue that was raised um, and, and that we grouped under this sort of systemic rigidity is was around the requirement for objective evidence. So we were told that there are many conditions that have a significant subjective component. Things like pain, uh, psychological distress, uh, fatigue. And so we were told that there's no test or objective evidence that healthcare providers could, could give to the board to sort of prove that yes, indeed, my patient has these conditions. And there was also some frustration when these types of conditions were treated just like physical injuries. So here's a healthcare provider from BC who said, throw the physical rule book out the window. It's not applicable to mental health. Start from scratch. Train your people. If there's a mental health issue on the file and the physical issue, go on the mental health side because the physical person, this is the, the case manager that deals with the physical claims, um, does not get it. That's just for me. I feel really strongly about it. I keep on saying a bone doesn't heal the same as the mind. So what we were told is that in some circumstances when healthcare providers weren't able to provide this objective evidence, this led to injured workers not being believed. And again, the development of adversarial relationships both between the injured worker and the board, but also sometimes between the healthcare provider and, and the board. And, this kind of um, injured worker stigma around not being believed was also an additional barrier to healing and return to work. And it was something that we were told healthcare providers had to deal with on top of whatever the presenting condition was. Okay, so the next thing I wanted to discuss around, um, related to this, this issue of systemic rigidity has to do with forms. Like I said at the start, the forms seemed to work well when injuries were straightforward. And in fact, when people talked about the forms for these straightforward um, uh, conditions, they, they, didn't, they didn't sort of describe any troubles that, that they had. But form-related problems were identified when healthcare providers tried to convey information to the board, uh, to their respective workers' compensation boards, about complex injuries and return-to-work problems. And I'll just give you two examples. So, in um, Newfoundland, and Labrador, Newfoundland and Labrador, the forms require the healthcare provider to look up a symptom code or an injury code and then put that in the form to describe what is happening with the patient. So you can imagine if it's a straightforward injury, that's not that difficult. But when the patient has a gradual onset injury, if they maybe go on and off work, if they've had surgeries, we were told that this becomes really, really cumbersome, and so the you know the healthcare provider is looking for the codes and trying to fit it into the form, so that becomes problematic. In BC, um, a, a different issue was raised, and that had to do with electronic word limits. So the forms, um, we were told, the, the the healthcare provider would type in, um, let's say, a diagnosis or what was happening in uh, with the patient, and then they would be cut off. Uh, because there were electronic word, word limits. And we were told actually, maybe this has been changed since the study, but that they didn't know that they were being cut off, so they would like, type everything in, submit, and only then realize that they were cut off. So you can imagine, very frustrating. Um, 
so this is the, a, a healthcare provider in BC who said, if someone has been in a major accident or a major work injury and has had lots of treatment or been admitted to hospital with surgery, it's really hard to get all of that in there, so on the form. You're only allowed 250 characters. So if you want to really start trying to give the WCB, you know, I want to do a good job for them and, I, and tell them that this guy has done this and he's having pain here now and seems to be getting depressed and he'll say, out of characters. So again, you can see the challenges of conveying a, comp a complete picture of a complex situation in, if, the, if a form is set up in, in this sort of way. So the next thing I want to talk about has to do with communication challenges. And communication challenges were identified as a barrier to effective collaboration. And one of the things we found interesting is that the problems seem to go in, in both directions. So we were told by case managers that healthcare providers were not very good at returning calls, that the forms weren't always filled out properly, and that they weren't providing enough or the right kind of information to, uh, to case managers that, to allow them to make a decision. On the other hand, healthcare providers told us that case managers were also not very good at returning calls, you know, that they would leave messages and then wouldn't get a call back, uh, that they didn't always keep healthcare providers in the loop about decision making um, and about return to work planning, and also about referrals to other healthcare providers. And we also heard about frustrations when healthcare providers had to communicate with non-medically trained personnel. And again, this was specifically around some of these more complex uh, conditions. So this is a quote from a healthcare provider in Ontario. She says, in the past, when I've talked to a case manager, they just don't really seem to understand what I'm talking about. I actually had a situation where a patient had a cervical, like a neck, cervical spine problem. And for some reason, they had requested records. And there was something in the patient's chart about cervical dysplasia, like of your cervix, the female genital organ. And they said that she wasn't covered because she had a pre-existing condition, which is completely ridiculous. And then I had to spend hours sorting this out. So obviously this is an extreme uh, example. <laughs> but we did, we did hear about um, how communication difficulties led to delays in decision making and uh, and to getting injured workers uh, treatment for, for their conditions. And one of the things we also heard about uh, was that as a result of some of these communication difficulties, sometimes injured workers were being used as a go-between the case manager and the doctor or between different healthcare providers, um, which is not always appropriate or, or ideal. So of course we want injured workers to be involved in, uh, in their claim. We want them to know what's what's happening with their treatment but if somebody is on medication if they don't understand medical terminology uh, it's not necessarily appropriate to ask them to relay what a chiropractor said to the uh, to the physician or the or, or have the case manager ask them to get certain things from from their health care provider okay the next thing I want to talk about is how uh, ways in which healthcare providers became, um, I guess, excluded or removed from the workers' compensation system. This is a long quote, but I'm going to read it to you because I think it's very illustrative. This is a specialist in Ontario. He says, the communication is very, very important. The physicians who are treating patients, I think that lack of engagement is a big problem. There should be a note sent to the physician and to the specialist of the patient saying, we are sending this patient to the specialty clinic. I don't think that happens, and I think that creates distrust. So the interviewer asks, distrust on whose part? On the physician's part, if your patient is going places that you have no control of where they're going, it feels very bad. You feel like a bad doctor. You feel like you're not treating your patient well. And then it encourages a lack of responsibility and engaging of the physician. So think about it. You get your patient, and he comes to you and says, oh, I have this appointment to go here, and the physician doesn't know anything about it, and it's just arranged for him. The physician will just throw up his arms and say, okay, well, if that's what you're doing, okay, I guess. And then you can imagine that he sort of feels like, well, I guess I'm not involved. So what are some of the factors that contribute to exclusion? Well, I've already discussed some of them. Um, repeated failed communication attempts, 
a lack of understanding of healthcare providers' role in the workers' compensation system. These different views on return to work, both in terms of the timing and appropriateness of return to work. Perceptions of systemic rigidity. Feelings that workers' compensation decision makers are predominantly concerned with cost containment. Um, I haven't talked about this, but this is it's in the final report if you're interested, but funding structures particularly for allied healthcare providers that make treating injured workers financially unsustainable. And the one I want to spend a little bit more time um, discussing is the use of internal medical consultants. So when we interviewed the case managers in uh, Manitoba and in British Columbia, we asked them about the use of internal medical consultants and they were very enthusiastic about um, the role that these internal medical consultants played and how helpful they were to them. That, that they really provided medical guidance to help them with decision making, decision making. Many of the case managers didn't have medical training and so it was really useful and, and helpful for them to have somebody on hand who could, could help them with, with that part of um, the claim. Uh, they had quick access to these people so they didn't have to wait around for a form to get returned or a letter to get sent back. And in some cases, they, these internal medical consultants um, bridge the gap between the board and the treating healthcare provider, so the external uh, healthcare provider. We also found that in BC and Manitoba specifically, some healthcare providers reported using the internal medical consultant as a resource. So if they were having trouble with return to work, or if they were, um, you know, they had a question about how the system uh, operated, they would they would call the internal medical consultant. However, overall, many healthcare providers we interviewed didn't know very much about internal medical consultants or the role that they played at. at in, within the workers' compensation uh, board in, in their jurisdiction. And in all provinces, there were some healthcare providers that were critical of the use of internal medical consultants, specifically their use in overturning external healthcare provider recommendations. So this is a specialist in Manitoba who said, the bottom line is, it's the medical advisor's opinion that counts, not necessarily the treating physician or the specialist that may know the patient better. But the internal decision within the WCB trumps even multiple care providers sharing the same concern. That's been my, my experience. So while the literature on return to work um, has a focus on collaboration and healthcare provider involvement in return to work, we did find there are a number of ways that uh, healthcare providers were really alienated from the workers' compensation process. So the last thing I want to talk about has to do with the broader kind of macro level context. And we were told that um, patients' access to healthcare services certainly has an effect on the return to work process and, and its success. We are told that many injured workers, particularly in northern and remote communities, do not have family doctors. And we certainly know that this is the case even in, in Toronto. And so there's a reliance on walk-in clinics or emergency rooms. And Again, this is particularly problematic for workers with some of these complex conditions. So we, it, it, this is a, a quote from an emergency room physician, and he was talking about seeing patients in the emergency room who had depression and chronic back pain. He said, I'm seeing them for 10 to 15 minutes out of their life, and so me, doing a WCIB form is probably not appropriate, except for those patients when someone breaks their arm or some major trauma. We deal with a lot of long-term issues but they're not appropriate in the emergency department, and that's my frustration. So he went on to, to discuss um, you know, some of the issues that, that he faced, and I'm sure they won't be a surprise to you, but lack of follow-up and continuity of care. So if somebody um, goes back to see the doctor in the ER, they'd be seeing a different, uh, a different healthcare provider. Little time to fill in forms, uh, no background knowledge of the patient, and really no time for any kind of meaningful return to work planning in, in those circumstances. So what are some of the take home messages and opportunities for change and improvement? Well, I, I think one of the things that came out very strongly both in the interviews and in the resource scan we did that I talked about at the very start of the presentation 
is that there really needs to be more clarity, discussion, and consistency regarding the role of healthcare providers. And ideally, the Workers' Compensation Board would have a discussion about what the role should be, and healthcare providers would also have that discussion, and then the two would have it together. Based on the study, um, the findings, there's a couple of possibilities that uh, you know should be considered in terms of the role of the healthcare provider. So, obviously, ongoing treatment of the injury or condition, uh, being generally supportive of return to work and communicating why return to work is often uh, good for physical and, and mental health, flagging and addressing issues that might complicate recovery and, and return to work. Identifying chronic pain or deterioration in mental health. So, again, probably the health, the treating physician is in a better place to do that than a case manager or even an internal medical consultant who might be seeing the patient for the first time. Communicating with the board about further treatment needs, such as counseling or occupational therapy. And we do feel like there's certain allied healthcare providers and occupational medicine specialists that are well positioned to provide information about functional abilities, readiness for return to work, or the appropriateness of certain types of accommodated work. Um, we, I guess we wondered whether GPs, just based on what we were told in the study, whether GPs uh, feel comfortable doing those things, particularly when it comes to some of these complex and uh, kind of prolonged workers' compensation uh, patients. One thing we, that also came out quite clearly is the need for more information about the workers' compensation system that is directed specifically to, uh, specifically to or for healthcare providers. You know, we were really surprised when we looked at all of the workers' compensation websites how often there was nothing about how the system operated under that healthcare provider uh, section, or even uh, or even about what the healthcare provider role was. So, like I said before, I think some of that information is already out there. I think it just needs to be put in a place where healthcare providers could access it in an easy way, and they don't have to search the entire website to you know to find it. I think there also needs to be a discussion about return to work, and like I said, there was a lot of support uh, uh, among the healthcare providers we interviewed. Uh, for, for return to work, but not at all costs. So really there needs to be a focus on safety, appropriateness, staying at work, and most importantly, problem solving. So healthcare providers have a sense of what to do if there are problems. So specific to the complex conditions, um, we were told that case managers uh, could benefit from training in the area of mental health and chronic pain, and specifically around helping them decreased stigma for injured workers who are presenting to the board with some of those conditions. We also like this idea that was brought up, um, I guess it was discussed in a paper by Seeing and McKechn on return to work, and they called for flexibility and not procedural rigidity. And um, I think that's also something that came out of the findings of this study. And we know, of course, that the Workers' Compensation Board is this big system, big bureaucracy. But I think there are ways of integrating some flexibility within within that large bureaucracy. So one way could be, um, you know, form flexibility. So giving healthcare providers an opportunity when they need to to really describe what is happening with their patient more fully. Uh, reconsidering objective evidence. What is meant by objective evidence? Is it realistic to expect healthcare providers to uh, provide objective evidence for certain types of injuries? And when healing extends beyond some of these recovery timelines, potentially offering greater support, so access to counseling, um, access to, to other types of support, not punitive measures. Because ultimately what we heard is when workers get their treatment cut off and then have to go through a series of appeals to get it reinstated, that just really derails things in terms of return to work. We also like this idea um, that of having an option on the forms of healthcare providers that allows them to flag when they need support uh, for return to work. And this is something that was being done in BC. So there's a little checkbox on the form and if the healthcare provider feels like they could use the support of a case manager or internal medical consultant, they check that and then 
they get a call, that then the board proactively reaches out to them. And there's also an option of completely opting out of, of return to work planning. And of course, that might be appropriate if you're a healthcare provider working in an emergency room or in a walk-in clinic. And then finally, in terms of um, internal medical consultants, you know, we really heard loudly how these internal medical uh, providers are a great resource for case managers. And I think they could also be a resource for healthcare providers. You know, they could be used to communicate with the treating healthcare provider and work collaboratively with that healthcare provider to, to solve some of these complex problems. But we also heard that they shouldn't be used to overturn medical recommendations and that the treating healthcare provider, particularly the GP, is in a good position to understand factors that will complicate recovery and return to work and that this insight should be integrated into treatment and return to work planning. So I'm going to stop here and we can have a discussion. Before I do, I just want to quickly acknowledge both the funder of the study. I don't know how to go back to the first slides. I'm just going to have to do this. Um, the funder of the study, and that is uh, the Workers' Compensation Board of Manitoba, and also all of the, uh, the research associates and co-investigators who were involved in the study, and specifically Marnie, Sabrina, and Bashak, who did a great deal of work on the data collection and the analysis and were a huge help uh, to getting this very large study finished. So thank you, and I look forward to your questions.